Well, good morning. That was a fun song, huh? Yeah, so let me tell you about my Jesus, right? That's why we're here, that's why you're here, and we're going to learn a little bit more about him today. It's nice to have a full house. Are you enjoying the one service? Yeah, it's kind of a good idea. I'm glad that you're uh, a part of that too. We're in part four of this New Year message series about elevating our life. It's like if you want to go from here to here, if you want to be more than you are, if you want to be all that God intended, there are six characteristics or six qualities that we know have to be a part of our life. I think there's more than that, but we're just going to look at six of them. And today we're looking at number four. We've already looked at what it means to be positive in life because there's so much negativity in our world. World. Would you agree with that? We've already looked at what it means to be grateful in our life. We've all already looked at what it means to be an encourager in our life. And here's what we know about those attributes, positive and grateful and encouraging. Those are attributes of God. So if you take the six qualities that we're studying for these six weeks, what we're really doing is some theology. We're learning what God is like, because here's the deal. When God remakes us, When Jesus changes our life, like that song just suggested, like when he changes our life, he makes us like God. We're becoming more and more like God. He's renewing us. The old us is put away, the Bible says, and a new us steps forward. Now, we don't step forward perfect. We don't step forward fully formed. Jesus said it's like being born again. We step forward as like little baby Christians, but we're new. And now we're growing to be all God wants us to be, which is to be more and more like him. So if God is positive and we've been recreated, he made us positive. You say, well, Brad, I'm a Christian, but I'm kind of negative. That just means you got to grow. You're still baby Christian. Yeah, well, we're to be grateful because that's an attribute of God. Well, Brad, I'm not very grateful. Well, you are grateful. Here's the point. You are grateful. He remade you grateful. You're just not leaning into that design. You're just not giving yourself to the new. And that's what we're learning. So today we take on another attribute of God. And some people are surprised that this is actually a part of God's nature. It's a part of God's character. And it's the attribute of generosity. This is huge because God is generous. And God created you to be generous, and he created me to be generous. Now, I'm going to read a big chunk of scripture to set the tone for the morning, and then we're just going to dive into some principles that we can learn together, all right? So check out the scriptures. This comes from a pastor. He was a missionary. His name was Paul. He wrote a lot of our New Testament, and he said this. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. The one who plants what? generously will get a we could stop right there put a little seed out there well good luck put a lot of seed out there guess what a lot comes back it just makes sense so here's the deal you must each decide who are you going to be what are you going to do about this you decide in your heart how much to give don't give reluctantly okay okay god don't do that That's not what God wants. Don't do it in response to pressure. Okay, okay, I will, I will. Don't do that. Look what God wants. God loves a person who gives. Go ahead and say it. Yeah, cheerfully. And God will. Here's the word again. Have you noticed how often this word is mentioned? God will generously provide all you greed. Wait a minute. No, that's not what it says. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say everything you want. Doesn't say the new Air Jordans. Doesn't say that. All you, all you need. But listen, I love this. You'll always have everything you need. Plenty left over. And what are we supposed, when God blesses us, what are we to do with the blessing? What does it say? To share with others. When I was a kid, we used to sing this song, Make Me a Channel of Blessing. And what that suggested was blessings don't come in to stay. Like God just blessing me and the blessings stay with me and I just get to dive into all these blessings. No, he gives through me. Blesses me so that I will have plenty to share with others. Does that make sense to you? Everything I need and plenty to share. Everything I need and plenty to share. Say it with me. Everything I need and... 
plenty to share. Now, this is counter to the prevailing mentality that I think affects so many people in our world today. It's what I call not enoughness. It's where I view life and my resources from a place of scarcity and lack. Like, okay, I know what God's blessed me with, but I'm not going to pass that on because if I pass it on, I'm not confident that God will give me more. It's really what we think about God. Like, if I pass this on, I'm not going to have enough. I'm going to lack. I'm going to have scarcity in my life. And in fact, the opposite is taught in the Scriptures. Like as we give, then we receive. So it's like God just keeps blessing. But like it stops with you, it dies with you. Here's one of the things from uh, the geography of the Middle East. Like this is the land of Jesus. Two big bodies of water in, in the Middle East, in, in Israel. And it's the Sea of Galilee and it's the Dead Sea. You want to know the difference between the two? Water comes into the Sea of Galilee from the mountains around it. Fresh water, beautiful sea. And then through the Jordan River, travels south to the Dead Sea. Why is it the Dead Sea? Because the Dead Sea hangs on to everything it gets. It doesn't, the water doesn't leave. Water doesn't go anywhere. It just stagnates. It's only the water that allows more water to pass through that stays alive and living. Does this make sense? So this is, I have everything I need and I have plenty. Not this scarcity mentality. Let's keep reading the scriptures. Scriptures say they share freely, like not under pressure, not reluctantly, and they give, here's the word, generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer, bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide, he will provide, he will provide. And then listen, don't miss this, and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity. Now, why does God increase your resources? Harvest of generosity. You see it again? It's the same thing we read a second ago. Meets my needs, plenty to share. Meets my needs, plenty to share. Increases so that I'm generous. Like it all goes together. The key point is that anything that comes my way is God's generosity to me, and then I, in turn, should be generous to others. I don't know if you know this, but through history, Christians have have carried the banner of generosity more than any other group in the world. You might not know this. Like Christian generosity has given more to the poor than governments ever have. Christian generosity has built more hospitals, built more orphanages through history than government or any other charitable organization. No movement on earth has alleviated the suffering of people like Christians throughout history. Why? Because God is generous. And when he remakes us, he remakes us in his image so that we will also be generous. It's like part of our nature then. Part of our new nature. So let's tie this together a little deeper. Look at this. Generosity is birthed in our hearts when we're saved. Now, not everybody here is a Christian. Not everybody here has a church background. And we toss out these church words like everybody just knows. Like, what does it mean to be saved? It's when you ask Jesus to forgive your sins, and you trust what he did on the cross for that to happen, and you surrender your life to follow his leadership. That's what it means to be saved. Sin's forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross, and now you follow him as the leader of your life. When that happens, generosity is birth. What I want to do, like if, if you're going to just remember one point today, like just remember one thing. I don't want you to tune me out after this, but this is the, like I want you to get this one. Our whole relationship with God, is based on generosity. It's what God generously gave. And then we turn around and give our life to him. It's like he generously gives, then we give our life back. Have you ever considered that this whole notion of salvation, being a Christian, it's all rooted in generosity. It all started with generosity. Because God did something generous in us, it makes us generous like him. Look at this scripture. 
For God so loved the world that he... Now, everybody wants to talk about God's love. But don't miss this other important attribute of God. Generosity. Like when he was thinking about what can I give to solve the problem of humanity, the sin problem, the broken problem, the guilt and shame problem. Like what can I give to fix this? And he gave his only son. Could you imagine anything more generous? Is it even possible that there's something more generous? No. God gave the most he could give, the most generous gift of heaven. He loved us, but if it stopped there and didn't change us, didn't provide anything for us, then it'd be ineffective. He loved us enough that it prompted generosity in the heart of God that he gave the finest gift of heaven so that we could find our salvation. Like, it is this connection that I want you to get. Like, when we're born into the family of God, when we're made new by the forgiving and powerful work of Jesus, we are made, we become generous people. Look at this next thing. Generosity is the way we break our sinful nature towards selfishness, and we become more like God. Let me say it another way. When we experience God's generosity, his grace, his salvation, the the gift of Jesus, when we experience that, like if you've really experienced that, you want people you care about to experience that. See, before Jesus, almost every good thing that happens in our life, we like that it happened for us. And we're pretty satisfied with that. I'm just glad it happened for me. But when God does a work in your life, You're not satisfied that it just happened for you. Now you want it to happen for people you care about, too. Give an example of this. There was this guy, and and he he used to have tracks. Now, this is going way, way back. This is OG Christianity, like when we had tracks. A track was like a track was like a little pamphlet, and it would tell the story of Jesus. It would it would tell that we have a need to be forgiven of our sin. And it told her how God remedied that problem by sending Jesus to die on a cross. He took punishment for us, paid the price for us, rose from the dead, proves he's the son of God, and he can forgive us, and we should follow him with our life. And there were these little stories. There were little booklets like this. We called them tracks, passed them out. And this guy, what he would do, whenever he'd go out to eat, he would leave a track for his waiter or his waitress. And to ensure that the waiter or waitress would read the track, he would always tip really, really well. Like, like on a, a $10 lunch, he'd stick a $20 bill in the track and leave it on the table, you know? So he had done that. A couple weeks later, he went back to the same restaurant where the same waitress was working, and she ran up to him, and she just threw her arms around him, and she said, I made the decision to follow Jesus with my life. I've become a Christian because of that track you left for me. And she said, and then I went home, and I called my husband, and over the phone, he accepted Jesus into his life too, and he's a Christian also. And this man was just amazed by that. And he said, now you say you called your husband. Like, was he, was he at work? Where, where was he? And she said he was in prison. And he became a Christian over the phone because I read that track to him. A couple years later, he gets out. And this man had the privilege of baptizing that woman and her husband because he cared. Like it wasn't just, oh, hey, I got mine. You get yours the best way you can. That's not what Jesus does in us. It's I've got mine. I want to share it with you. Like there is a connection between our salvation and the generosity we express so that others might come to know Jesus as well. You know, sometimes we say, you know, all churches talk about money. Most churches I know don't. Most churches I know talk about Jesus and how people can find Jesus. But for that to happen, it does have to be supported with our giving. What most of us have never done is is to realize that when I give through my church, there is a direct connection to that and people having their lives changed and becoming Christians. Generosity takes selfishness down And it changes our life, and we begin to care about others. Now, I will tell you, selfishness is deeply rooted. It starts when we're babies. Babies don't say, oh, here, you can have some of mine. Babies don't do that. 
Babies say, mine, 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 me, 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 wah, 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 right, right? You have to grow and work to get out of that whole pattern of selfishness. So God has given us a plan whereby on a consistent way we break selfishness in our life and we increase our trust in God. And it's called tithing. Look at this. Tithing is God's design to consistently work selfishness and greed out of our hearts and to work faith into our hearts. Now, let me just break this down. To tithe means 10%. It means one-tenth. That's what the word tithe means. So when we think about giving 10% of our income through God's church, if we consistently do that, here's what we're doing. We're consistently saying, I'm letting, I'm letting go of selfishness, and I'm going to trust God to provide. Now, you see why faith would be a big part of this. I think you do. Because many people here, maybe all of us here, are like, dude, I barely live on 100%. How am I going to live on 90% if I give 10% to the work of God? How's that going to work? I have to trust God. Like, my selfishness has to go down, and my faith has to go up. Does that make sense to you? Now, I will tell you this. Here's what some people want to do. They're like, you know what? Let me get to the end of my month. How many of you have ever had a month where there was more month left than money? You know what I'm talking about? It's like it's the 25th, and I'll eat again on the 1st of next month, right? It's that kind of thing. It's like, hey, dude, I, I, the check's in the mail next week, you know, but not this week. Like, it's like we wait, and they say, oh, well, I just don't have anything for God. And God says, well, that'll never build your faith. Like, if you're just going to wait to see if you have it, that's all up to you. So God teaches to give the tenth first. Here's how it worked in like the, the Hebrew culture, like in the ancient Hebrew culture. A guy would have sheep, and the very first lamb that was born in the flock, he would offer that to God as a sacrifice. He didn't wait till he had ten lambs, and then he picked the worst one and gives God the leftover. Oh, that's the one that always gets in the garden. You know, that's the one that's been really bad. Like, they, he, didn't, he didn't do that. First lamb gives his first to God without knowing whether there will be any other lambs born. Do you see how that would, have, would build your faith? Because I, I don't know. I'm going to have to trust God that more lambs will come, but I'm going to give God my first. What I have seen is if we can learn, like there's no harder place probably to put God first in your life than to put him first in your finances. But if you put him first in your finances, it's like your whole life follows. Jesus said it like this, wherever you put your treasure, your heart will follow. You put your treasure first for God, then all of your life aligns. Look at this. When God is first in my finances, it's easier to put him first where? Everywhere else. I mean, I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you would agree putting God first in my finances is the hardest. It's the hardest. Like, I'll give God a little extra time every week, or I'll give God my abilities every week, but man, to give God, you know, the first 10, like, I, ooh, I, ooh. But if I do that, everything, because where I put my treasure, it's like the rest of me just follows. Now, listen, I've been around churches a long time. I understand people. People say, Brad, dude, like that's an Old Testament concept, like tithing, the 10%. Like we live by the New Testament. I'm in the new book, you know. I'm not, all, I'm not really about all that. What we need to understand is that there are some universal principles that transcend Old and New Testament. I'll give you an example. Like Malachi is a very famous, it's the last book of the Hebrew Old Testament. It's the last book, and in the last book, there's a section there about tithing, this giving the first 10%. And it says this, bring the tithe into my house, God says. So that's right there, but that's in the Old. Then it's 400 years until the first events of the New Testament happen. So we got centuries that pass until the events of the New Testament happen. So it's like, okay, people are waiting, people are waiting. But look what was said right before that part of tithing. God said, I am the Lord, I don't change. So what's not changing? What is the unchanging principle between Old Testament and New Testament? And it's simply this, put God first. We're learning to put God first. We're growing to put God first. 
And the principle that we're learning this morning is if we put him first in our finances, everything else lines up after that. Now, I do know through the years there has been some pretty glaring distortions about giving in the Christian community. Like, like there's this thing called prosperity gospel. How many of you ever heard of prosperity gospel? It basically says this. Make Jesus your choice, drive a Rolls Royce. I mean, that's kind of what, that's kind of what it says. If I give to God, God's going to make me rich. I can manipulate God into my wealth. Really? Think you can? Like that's so bogus and that's so twisted and that's so wrong because this has always been about the heart and it's always been about putting God first and it's always been about motive. And if our motive is I'm going to give so that I get, we miss the point. Listen, generosity isn't a gimmick for the prosperity gospel. It doesn't support the poverty gospel. There is a, there is a school of thought among Christians that all Christians should be poor. Like, take a vow of poverty. Scripture doesn't teach that. But what it does show, what Christian giving is about, is what I call the provision gospel, which means you plant the seed, and it's God's job to bring a crop. You do your part, God does his part. Poverty gospel says you don't have anything. Prosperity gospel says you can manipulate God. But the provision gospel says, I believe God will provide. I just have to do my heart. Does that make sense to you? God does not bless giving. He blesses the right heart. Giving with the right heart. Can you put the next one up? He doesn't just bless giving. He blesses giving with the right heart. Can we? There we go. Look. Blesses giving with the right heart. It's always been about the heart. It's always been about sincerity. It's always been about the right Motive. Look at this next one. Where your motive about your treasure is, that says a lot about your heart for God. Like what I'm doing with my finances, where God is in the pecking order, in the priority of my life, where that's going to show up is finances. I put him there first, everything else aligns. I think giving will do more to adjust your heart than almost any other thing you can do as a follower of Jesus. Because Jesus said, where you you lay that treasure, that's where I'm going to find your heart. Now, there are a bunch of people, and I know this, who would say, Brad, I have not been giving God my first, and I have not been giving God my first 10%. The first thing I would want to say to you is, you're not a bad person. You don't love God less than anybody else. I want you to hear that. It's the devil who wants us to feel ashamed. It's the devil who wants us to feel less than. That's not what God does. What we would acknowledge is that we're just growing like everybody else. Like there are some people here, you probably need to grow in the area of your temper. And there's some people here you probably need to grow in the area of moderation and some, you know, overdoing of an aspect of your life. I mean, we're all growing somewhere. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and say, you're growing somewhere. Don't point where they're growing. Just say, you're growing somewhere. You're growing somewhere, right? If you say, Brad, I haven't, I haven't done the first, and I don't give to God first, and I, and I haven't done the 10%, so... Like, all I would say to you is then you've only identified, what you've done, you've identified a place to grow. And that's exciting. Like, that's positive. You've just identified a place to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think that's awesome. I know the argument. People say, Brad, I can't afford, I can't afford to give. Like, here's what I'd say. And this is like counterintuitive. You'll never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. And what I mean by that, it is this consistent practice that breaks the grip of selfishness it breaks the grip of fear it takes away that not enoughness and it declares every time you do it i trust god i trust god i trust god listen this is not about numbers on a spreadsheet you say okay well here's my bills here's my income i don't have enough i can't afford to do it i can only tell you this i'm 63 years old i know i know i look a lot older but it it's like all my life 
all my life, I have had months where the math didn't work. But my parents taught me, and my dad's mother taught my dad, put God first. And like the craziest, the craziest thing. You know, like we'll get, you know, a tax refund. We'll get some random like insurance thing like we were part of a class action because we drank Listerine I mean I, it's like it's a, it's a, what's this Karen to come up and say what's this check for I don't know right it's like the weirdest thing but it just meets the need and God had said I'll meet your need and you will have enough to help others like that's just the promise of God you can't do it by math you have to do it by faith. Now here's something, it's, it's like a shift in perspective that I think will help. Here's how most people give. Most people say, okay, I have this much money. Like I have $100. This is my $100. And, and Brad, what you're suggesting is, is that I give God 10 of my dollars. I give God 10 of my dollars. And that's not what I'm suggesting. I want us to change our perspective from giving to God and change that perspective to returning to God what is already His. Like, we think, oh, that's my hundred. No, that's God's hundred. And we return ten of it to Him because it's all always been His. Like this. Okay, you come up to me and say, Brad, you and Karen, you, you have two cars in your family, right? Yep. Brett, would you and Karen be able to get by with one car for a couple days? And I'd say, well, why? And you'd say, well, my car broke down. We only have one car, and we need to borrow a car for a couple days. And I said, well, we, okay, yeah, I think we could do that. You know, we could figure out how to hand our car off. And, you know, okay, yeah, you could borrow our car for a couple days. And let's just say then you come back to us like three days later, and you say, guess what? I've been praying, and you say to me, Brad, I've been praying and I've decided to give you this car. It's like, what, what have you been smoking, brother? Because that, that's my car. Well, yeah, 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 but I'm, I'm going to give it to you. Dude, that's, that's my car. All you're doing is returning to me what was already mine. Does this make sense? So when we tithe, when we're part of this generous body that is so unselfish, we want to see other people find their way to Jesus, we're going to support that. Like we, when we become those people, what we understand is I am just returning to God something that was already His. And there's three ways that you see this happening in the Scriptures, and we're almost done. Three types of giving. There's the tithe, and that's the returning to God, the first 10%. There's tithe. You see that in the Bible. But then you also see this other word called offering. You'll see people giving their tithes and their offerings. Offerings was anything you give in addition to your 10%. And that happens sometimes. Like, we just do it. We just did it in December around here. We call it our gift for Christ at Christmas offering. And what I said during the month of December was, hey, this is in addition to what you regularly give. So you have that, the regular, then you have the over and above your regular that you give. And then there's a third category of giving that you see in the scriptures, and simply it's called extravagant offering. So you have your tithe, you have your offering, you have your extravagant offering. I'll give you an example of an extravagant offering. Uh, there's this woman, and she was at the temple, and Jesus was at church that day, and at the end of the service here's what would happen people would walk out the back and there'd be there'd be this little collection basket and that's where people would drop their their offerings for the temple and that particular day Jesus stood there and watch son of God you're walking out brother can I borrow can I borrow this <laughs> This woman walks out, and the Bible says she gave two mites. They're called the widow's mite. She was a widow. Husband had died. And she had the mite. Mite, let's just call it the equivalent of a penny. It's like the smallest coin of the day. And she had two of them. And she dropped them in. And Jesus said, hold the line. I'd like everybody's attention. 
this woman just gave more than all y'all. That's plural. Y'all is singular. All y'all is plural. <laughs> she just gave more than all y'all. And they looked in the basket. She'd given two pennies. And Jesus told why she'd given more. He said she gave all she had. She gave everything she had. See, extravagant giving isn't about amount. It's always about the heart. It's always about the heart. I mean, through my life, I've seen this in the lives of Christians, and it's just so beautiful. You know, single mom's car breaks down, and a family feels touched by God, and they, they give her a car. I mean, I've, I've seen things like that. You know, ch churches have had building programs where they're building like a new building, and people like cancel vacations and, and, and offer that to the... I've seen extravagant giving, never about the amount, but it's always about the heart. Through your life, when you start doing this, tithes and offerings and extravagant offerings, you'll find that it's absolutely a wonderful way to live your life. And it will become kind of a contagious thing. Like the more you do it, the more you just want to do it because it is truly more blessed to give than to receive. I'll tell you this morning, God is looking for people that He can bless, but the people that He is looking for are people who will then take from that blessing and they will in turn be a channel of blessing. Because God does want to feed the hungry of the world. God does want to help the poor in the world. And God owns everything. You, you know the, the economic equations of supply and demand? God has all the supply. And we look at our world and we see that there's plenty of demand. What's between those two? You are. I am. And God wants us to be a channel of blessing. He made you to be generous. So what do you do? You start somewhere. You start somewhere. Wherever you are, you grow in this. And God will in turn grow in his blessings to you. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you to just move in our midst right now. And we thank you because of your son Jesus who offered the most generous gift in the history of the world. God, we're generous because it's a reflection of you. And when you recreated us, when we were born again, when you forgave us and made us new, you put this in our heart. Now you're just asking us to lean into that original design, why you made us. We live in a world with such a scarcity mindset. People are so afraid they're not going to have enough if they give something. But God, you've, you've shown the opposite. That the people who are generous are the people that you just so enjoy. Blessing with more because they will in fact be even more generous. I wonder how many of you in the room and how many watching online right now would say, Brad, I, I want to be a channel of blessings. I want to be a person God can use like that. I want to grow to trust God. <laughs> like I don't, I don't feel like there's enough to do this, but but I could see how this could affect my faith. And I want to elevate my life. I don't want to stay the same. I'll begin growing in this area with God's help. I want you to really think about that. And I want you to step into it. Father, I pray that we would be faithful to You. And from this heart of worship that we would return to You from that which You have given to us. We want to put you first in every area of our life. First in our time, first in our calendar, first in our priorities, our first and most important relationship, and first in our generosity. God, we choose you first. We choose you first in every area of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody here said, Amen. Amen.